Jennifer and Adriana Wicks. It's been 20 years since the 21-year-old Jennifer Wicks and her two-year-old daughter, Adriana, disappeared in Cross Plains, Tennessee. And after nearly and after two decades with no answers, a new detective has taken over the case. Jennifer and Adriana's family have waited for nearly two decades for movement on this case. Jennifer and Adriana were last seen on March the 25th, 2004, at a gas station in Cross Plains. Jennifer's boyfriend at the time, Joey Benton, told police he dropped them off at the gas station and watched them get into a white car and leave. The next day, Benton said Jennifer came to his house in the same white car without the baby. Police had never been able to confirm his story. Benton has always been a person of interest, and the case is considered a homicide. Well, maybe a double homicide. Do you feel helpless, said her family, especially after all these years? And why did he drop her off at this gas station? And did he? Did she tell him, uh, drop me off this gas station, I have someone coming to pick me up? Did she say who this person was? Were the two of them fighting and he just told her to get out of the car beside of the road? And were there any cameras at that time uh, up around this gas station to verify whether or not they were ever even there? Because this was 2004. I would assume that they probably had cameras at that time. Jennifer's sister told Dateline that the thought of her sister and niece still takes her back to the moment she found out they were missing. It was panic is the only way I can describe it. Casey said the grief has stayed with her for two decades. It just kind of consumes you and attacks you most of the time, especially around their birthdays and the holidays. We were very close, said her mother. She would always write me these sweet letters telling me how sorry she was if we ever had an argument. She remembers when her daughter found out she was pregnant at the age of 19. Things just happen in life and we're going to deal with it, she recalls. We're going to make the best of it and this is going to be a very loved baby. And she was. Lord have mercy, she says. I mean, she was just so precious and beautiful. Dateline spoke with Kathy's sister, who said she and her niece Jennifer were very close. She loved her baby more than anything on earth. She told Dateline about a conversation she had with Jennifer. She felt like Adriana was an angel and had come into her life to save her. She's probably just been an angel for me and saved me in so many ways from going down the wrong path. Not long after this conversation, Jennifer and the little baby disappeared. According to Kathy, Jennifer and Adriana had been living with her in Cross Plains, Tennessee. She said Jennifer and her boyfriend, Joey Benton, started dating in the summer of that year, so I don't guess that he was the father of the little girl. Kathy told Dateline she didn't like the way Joey sometimes treated her daughter and granddaughter and that she would not, sometimes not allow him in the house. But now the aunt, Lisa, says that she didn't see any indication of that. She said, there was no indication to me that there was anything going on between the two of them other than two young people that loved each other. They were crazy about each other. Well, sometimes people don't know what goes on in other people's relationships. They may appear to be crazy about each other, and then one or the other of them may be overly jealous or possessive, and that may take on a private a private thing, you know, that may be something that they argue about in private, so maybe they didn't see it. But if they were living in the home with her mother, then she probably did witness some of that. So Jennifer broke up. Jennifer and Joey broke up briefly in the fall. The couple started seeing each other again shortly after that, unknown to her mother. 
In December of 2003, Jennifer and Adriana moved back in with Joey and his parents, Joseph and Cindy Benton. Jennifer had limited contact with her mother and sisters after that, though they would communicate over the phone. They had limited physical contact, meaning she didn't really come around to visit, but she would call them on the phone. This could have been his possessiveness. I'm not, you know, I'm just saying what the mother was was picking up on. Maybe he moved them away from her and into with his family where he had a little bit more control over where she went, who she talked to. So now this was her younger sister, Casey, who was turning 16. She says that he did drop her off at the birthday party and she came to see her and that would probably be the last time that she saw her sister and her niece. Just weeks later, Jennifer and Adriana would vanish. Lisa, the aunt, I know there's all these different people. Kathy is the mother. Lisa is the aunt. Lisa told Dateline that she drove Jennifer and the baby to the hospital on Monday, March the 22nd, 2004. She said the baby had been a little bit sick and she also had a rash. Kathy says she met Jennifer, Joey, and Adriana on Tuesday, March the 23rd, outside of the Dollar General, so she could give her daughter some homemade cream for the baby's rash. The, ba the baby was crying to come home with me, Kathy remembered, but I had to work the next day. I said, you can come to Mimi's next weekend. According to Kathy, Jennifer agreed to let the baby come and visit and stay with her over the next weekend. That meetup outside the Dollar General store was the last time that Kathy ever saw her daughter and granddaughter. Kathy did get a call from her daughter the next day on Wednesday from the Benton residence. According to Kathy, Jennifer was distraught over a fight she had had the night before with a member of Joey's family. Kathy said she tried to calm her daughter down over the phone. I just said everybody will be okay. Everybody will calm down by tomorrow and things will be okay. And if not, you call me tomorrow, she remembered telling her daughter. According to Kathy, Jennifer told her she would call her again the next day, but I never heard from her again. Lisa, her aunt, said that on Thursday, March the 25th, she got a call from her niece. According to Lisa, Jennifer said that she did not want to live at the Benton house anymore and told her that she was planning on moving out as soon as she spoke to Joey that day. She said, if he does not agree for us to leave when he gets home, I'm leaving and coming to your house. Lisa said that she left a spare key outside and told Jennifer just in case she did come back to her house, she would be able to get, let herself in. She never came, and needless to say, Lisa believes that something happened to Jennifer that day. I also know for a fact that if something had not happened to her, she would have called me, and she didn't. Dateline spoke to Jennifer's cousin, Jeff Grayson, who was Lisa's son. Jeff said that on March the 25th, 2004, he was working with Joey Benton at a construction site. They were friends. It was just a normal day, he said. We were just working, you know, and Joey got a phone call and said he had to leave. It was really fast. It was really like something happened, you know, like, I got to go, I got to go. It was really, really urgent. Casey and Kathy said that Joey later told them he found Jennifer locked inside the bedroom when he got home that day. That evening, he took Jennifer. That evening, he said he and Jennifer took a drive to talk about things. And according to Casey and Kathy, Joey said that Adriana was with them. They decided to break up while they were driving around. Dateline reached out to Joey Benton over text in March of 2024 and asked for an interview. He agreed and replied, 
I've never declined to answer any questions on this matter. Despite multiple attempts, Dateline has not been able to conduct an interview. Dateline also reached out to Joey's mother, Cindy, who said she respectfully declined to discuss things. Dateline was unable to contact any other family members. The Robertson County Sheriff's Office was the initial investigative agency. In December of 2013, ahead of the 10th anniversary of their disappearance, they posted details about the investigation on their website. I don't know who who she had gotten into an argument with in the house that day, if it was the mother in law, the father in law, or the the mother and the father or or the father of her boyfriend. I don't know if there were other relatives living there or if it was someone who'd come to the home to visit. Maybe there's more details in the story as I read on. I think probably what happened was he come home, she probably told him I'm leaving. It could have been also that while he was at work that day, this argument that she'd had with this person came back up and escalated, and that person might have been responsible for having harmed her. Just like in any of these types of cases, in most of these types of cases, especially in a small town, you have your rumor mill. And I came across this website as I was doing some research, and this is all from 2009. Some of these go back as far as 2004. This is some comments that were taken from local people who were talking about this, who were talking about this family, this this Bitten family. And um, I'm just going to read from this. It's called Blue Crime Hunter. I'm often shocked beyond belief when reading about a crime story, but the story of Jennifer and Adriana who, um, according to some, the family called her Nina. I didn't even know existed. I stumbled upon this story on the web, and after more research, I found information ranging from topics to the web sleuth sites. Now, topics, I've brought topics up a time or two. Most of you, some of you probably remember Topics was this gossip site that was anonymous. Everyone used these fake names and everybody just kind of went on there. And it ranged from everything from just hatred, gossip, uh, downright, you know, pounding hatred towards certain people to just local events. And, you know, it was just different things, discussions. And, but, After more research, it is enough garbage to make you want to throw up. Jay's mother, Kathy, is on a mission to find out what happened to her precious family member. So they're talking about Jennifer's mother here, Kathy. Um, She is on a mission to find out what happened to her precious family members, only to be told that her daughter was a hoe This isn't the typical commentary usually found on a message board in a crime case. Usually, the support of the public is key, except there are cases where there are the usual guilty who have their supporters backing them up. So what they're saying here is is that this Joey and his family had people on there, you know, backing them up and, and criticizing this young mother criticizing her lifestyle, you know, making up whether it was true or not. They're they're calling her these horrible names and saying that she was just a bad mom, that she was doing all these bad things. Jennifer and her baby went missing on allegedly on the evening of March the 25th, 2004. According to her boyfriend, Slimy Joey Benton, he dropped them off at a gas station. He told law enforcement that he last saw her when he dropped her and her daughter off at around 9.30 that night. He stated that they left with someone in a white car. Now, he claims it was a four-door Mustang, which I didn't know that a Mustang was a four-door. I don't think I've ever seen a four-door Mustang. Somebody correct me here. Um... So this makes everybody more suspicious. 
He then claims that this girl, this girlfriend, Jennifer, shows up at his home the next day looking for her income tax return while she was driving the white car. At this time, he claims the little girl was not with her, but he has been unable to give law enforcement a proper make or model of the car. Since the time of her disappearance, the Benton family who she was living with have been hesitant in their cooperation. There have been searches on the land that is quite expansive, but there's never been a full search. Cadaver dogs have not had a chance to comb the area. What is the more, more troubling and disturbing in this case is all this slander and trash talk about Wicks and her family. Not only have they had to deal with the Benton family after learning that Joey likes to run his mouth after he consuming too many drugs and alcohol. So here's a few things from this topics. Keep in mind, Topics was a gossip site, an anonymous site, and people just said whatever they felt like saying that they probably wouldn't say if their faces were being exposed. The boy's name is Joey Benton. This information should be passed to Lieutenant Don Bennett at the Sheriff's Department. This would not be the first time this boy, and boy is in parentheses, has been drugging it up at a party and bragged about murdering these people, the Jennifer and the baby. It's outrageous that he's still allowed to roam the streets of Robertson County. Now keep in mind, this little girl was not his daughter, so he had no connection to her. her his family had no connection to her. So to say that she might possibly have been sold or given away to somebody, um, if it had been his child, it's a good possibility that maybe they would have passed the child off to another family member somewhere uh, to keep away from this area. But since he wasn't the father, it's a good possibility that he did kill the baby. He may have killed the baby in retaliation to something that she did. There is also speculation and rumor here in this story that the child might have been sexually abused. The family members of Joey Benton were posting and they were, you know, saying disparaging things against Jennifer, um, saying that she was on drugs and alcohol. They couldn't get her sober. They wouldn't let her stay in the house with them. They made her... Uh, stay in a barn with Joey and um, then of course there were people supporting her side saying you know that these people were really mean to her and that they were just bad people that they'd been involved in a lot of criminal activity there was speculation that the little girl had been uh, molested keep in mind she had taken her to the emergency room not long before she went missing and a lot of people were saying that it was because the baby had been having trouble going to the bathroom and that she had developed a rash. And a lot of people were saying someone was molesting the child, that it was about to come out, that this was the reason Jennifer was upset and that the family had to get rid of her before she came out with these allegations now this is all on rumor sites and none of this was ever you know proven but i'm i'm not going to go through all the comments i'm just going to post i will post a link to that uh, website so if anyone wants to read that for themselves the investigation led deputies to the robertson county home of jennifer's boyfriend joey benton where they were Jennifer and the baby had been living. Joey claimed that on the evening of March the 25th, Jennifer asked him to take her to the grocery store in Cross Plains to use the phone. Maybe that's just a story that he made up. According to the Post, Joey told officials that he dropped Jennifer and the baby 
at the grocery store briefly before then driving to a local Exxon station where they got out of the car. Benton said he pulled across the street and watched as a white four-door car pulled up and Jennifer and the baby got inside. Jen Benton also claimed that on March the 26th, 2004, Jennifer showed back up at his house and collected her belongings and said that she needed some time away. The Robertson County Sheriff's Office noted that Joey's claim of driving them to the grocery store and the Exxon station was never proven. It was never, there was never any witnesses or anything that could say definitely that, that he did that. Despite countless hours of investigation and numerous interviews, the last person known to have spoken to Jennifer was her father, Michael, who, phone records confirmed, talked with her at approximately 11 a.m. on March the 25th, 2004. Michael Wicks, her father, lived in Manchester. He told detectives that his daughter spoke of an argument that she had had with Joey Benton's family and that she looked forward to seeing him the following Sunday. Michael Wicks said he never heard from his daughter again. Kathy Nell, her mother, reported her and the baby missing on Saturday, March the 27th. According to the Robertson County Sheriff's Office, as of December 2013, the Benton household has been searched on four separate occasions. No one, including Joey Benton, has been eliminated as possibly being involved in the disappearance. The Sheriff's Office noted that there has always been strong implications of foul play, and it was investigated as a homicide from the very beginning. In a 2013 release ahead of the 10th anniversary, they announced they, the case had formally been classified as a homicide. So if the case was classified as a homicide and the home had been searched four times, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say they were suspecting either Joey or members of his family or all to be involved. It's part of the grieving process, she said. It never changes. There's not a lot of hope left, she said, so I just have to live with my old memories. The problem is, is that I get older, memories seem to fade. I mean, the memory of them will never be completely gone, but I can't remember the sound of my daughter's voice. Adriana would be 22 today. I've always held out hope. That's the reason I'm on Ancestry.com, Kathy told Dateline. Because if Adriana ever, if she's out there and she ever thinks, you know, that she may find out she's adopted or maybe she's with some family member um, and she just feels like I don't know who I am or where I belong, Maybe she will do one of these DNA ancestry kits. Maybe just out of curiosity and that she might match with me. Jennifer's cousin Jeff told Dateline that the ever-present grief over the last 20 years has turned our family upside down, he said. Kathy, Lisa, Casey, and Jeff separately expressed there's nothing i'd love more than to find out what the hell happened he said so they 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 served a search warrant on the property very recently and they said it did not have anything to do with jennifer or the baby so what are they searching for It's important to remember that the case remains open and active and that the sheriff will not speak about an active investigation. So, goes on to say that though the sheriff's office is not officially connecting the dots, the internet is abuzz today following reports that multiple agencies are at the home 
on Owens Chapel Road. The home carries connections to Jennifer and Adriana Wicks. So this must be the home that they lived in when this happened. The presence of law enforcement at the home and the sheriff's office with the assistance of TBI is executing a search warrant at the residence in relation to an active investigation. So I wonder how well those areas were searched. Is there a lake near that property or a pond? Tennessee, I'm sure there's lakes and ponds, you know, pretty close by. After receiving numerous reports of loud explosions around 11 p.m. Wednesday evening, Smoky Barn News conducted an investigation and found that the Robertson County Emergency Management Agency is engaged in an operation. While specifics were not disclosed, it was confirmed that the agency is ensuring public safety. It goes on to recount the story that he told about taking her to the store and dropping her off. I find that story very hard to believe, according to what the mother said, that he, that she saw, she saw signs that he was somewhat controlling of her daughter, and she didn't really like him all that well. And then the daughter calls up and tells the aunt about this fight that she'd had with a family member of his just a day earlier. And that she wants to move out. She wants him to move out as well. The best thing she could have done was just pack a bag and bring the baby and just say, you know, ask the aunt or the mom or someone to come pick her up. As season to remember services in memory of homicide victims are held throughout the country at this time of year, the Robertson County Sheriff's Office is committed to not letting Jennifer and Adriana be forgotten. I strongly believe that there are persons in this community who know what happened to them. They are reluctant to come forward for one reason or another. Today, we strongly encourage our citizens to help find answers and to bring closure to this family. This is Sheriff Bill Holt. Hope said a special tip line has been set up for anyone that wants to leave information can contact an investigator at the Robertson County Sheriff's Office at 615-478-5763. So just to close this story out, I'll just say as of today, the story, the story has picked up some new leads, apparently. Whether those are uh, legitimate. And I don't know what these explosions were. Um, were. Were they maybe indicating that somebody was burning something to get rid of old evidence on the property to make sure that it would never be found? I don't know. Was it drug-related? I don't know that either. But if anything new, I'll, I'm going to continue to follow this story. I'm going to follow the Facebook page for any new updates. There's a $25,000 reward for information in the case. If you know anything, call the Robertson County Sheriff's Department at 615-384-7981. You may remain anonymous. And if anything new comes up about the story, I will do a follow-up. Thanks for watching.